I'm Charlie Bright of Gold Derby, and today I'm speaking with uh, Karina Manishil, the executive producer of the Netflix animated uh, program Enter Galactic as part of our Meet the Experts TV animation panel. Um, first question I wanted to ask you, Karina, is um, was this project always intended to be an animated project uh, when it was first uh, uh, devised by you know, Kenya Barris and Kid Cudi? That, that's a that's a great question. It actually was in in its in its original iteration. The kind of evolutions that it took is this in its very nascent stage started with Scott, who's Kid Cudi, Scott Maskety, having this feeling like visuals and music were separated. If he does an album, the label will give him two music videos. But in terms of creating a holistic visual interpretation of his music, there wasn't, wasn't really there. an opportunity to do that. So Enter Galactic was really birthed out of this idea of how do we create a holistic experience. And in the initial conversations with Kenya, the first kind of iterative was this almost anthological sequence where each uh, episode was inspired by a song. And then in conversation with Netflix, where Kenya had his deal, the thought of uh, the animated group especially responded to this because they felt like music tethered to animation doesn't have the life cycle of just an, an album, but really can live in perpetuity and be something that people continue to come back to. And one of the anthological episodes we had was this animated love story and decided, well, why don't we make that intergalactic? So it was a little bit serendipitous in a sense that a concept that started out a lot broader than was driven by specificity over the partnership and, and Netflix's perspective on what might be the best way to tell the story. So um, how did this project come about with um, with regard to that specific, to the specific story of, yeah. of uh, Jabari and Meadow and, and their relationship? Yeah, so that was always this kind of nascent idea that Scott was thinking of in this early, in this early iteration. But as we started to really lean into the romance and into this story, uh, Scott was really unlocking a lot of songs that were speaking to love. So when we were having the formal pitch with Netflix, Scott had three songs that were already written um, and then you know presented the idea of what this could be. And on the heels of selling it, then we brought in Butch Mules, the director, Ian Adelman and Maurice Williams, the showrunner. And collectively we were sitting, I remember it vividly, we were sitting in East West Studios, which was Scott's recording studio at this at the time with like a giant whiteboard up, going through beat by beat what was gonna happen in the story, who these characters were, where they came from, what the relationships actually looked like, where the music would play. And it was all very deliberate prior to going into script, certainly also acknowledging that the music was such a storytelling component of that. So there were even beats, which is kind of interesting to think about where Scott had music going in, but then also he knew, for instance, there's going to be a point where uh, Jabari and Meadow see each other for the first time or when they're making love for the first time and there's, or when they break up, there's going to be these key beats of music that he's going to want to underscore it with. So it also brought specificity back to him as a recording artist to do something that felt deliberate for a project. So was this, uh, is there an, a Kid Cudi album that's, uh, yeah. okay, so there, this was, yeah. uh, uh, this was done in, uh, was, was there any point that was pretty, uh, that was, that was kind of difficult for him to get that right song for that right moment to, to have it flow properly? Yeah. It's such a good question. I mean, it was interesting because there were some things that were a little bit unexpected. I think when you consider the trajectory of an artist in music, their first album tends to be the freest because that's where they're not limited by expectation or what fans are looking for or trying to honor something that you've done before. But after that, all of a sudden, there's a perspective of what audiences expect you to sound like or what they're hoping that they're going to hear from you. And I think with Intergalactic, this was Scott's 10th studio album. And had he just released a love album without, uh, you know, a narrative as to why it might not have been the expectation. It might not have gone to gone to code. So for him to have created or created it around the show, I actually feel like it freed him up as an artist. So he was able to do something that was a little bit unexpected of him simply by virtue of the story being about love. So uh, I do have a, a bit of more of an animation nerdy question. I don't know oh. if you'll be able to answer it, but were <laughs> any of the characters 
were there any characters that were difficult to nail down the design for uh for how they for how they uh ended up uh appearing you know what there was such a deliberate process that fletch had set up for these characters i mean even to the sense that when they were recording their dialogue, they were filming the recording so that they felt like the movements of the lips and the manners, mannerisms would all match who the person was. So I, I, it didn't really feel like there was anything in the character design that got held up. In fact, maybe it's even easier because there was, you know, a sample of what you were drawing based off of. There were certain intricacies, which are quite sweet, that some of the talent wanted, like Scott has always wanted dreadlocks, but, you know, the, the possibility of growing them out are certainly not as easy as allowing Jabari to have them. Or Timothy Chalamet was like, let's shave my character's head and do something a little bit different. So there were moments that I think uh, I, the talent had fun with what their, what their likeness is could be, but I think the the process that Fletch had built, uh, you know, moved pretty seamlessly through all of them. And uh, uh, also on the subject of how uh, the look of the show, the, the animation is so distinctive and it. it really just, it, it's really something to look at. And how was, was how was that, uh, how, how did that become the agreed upon way that they wanted it to look? Well, firstly, thank you for saying that. I have to say that the conversation where it started with Fletch almost became the conversation of where it ended. So also in East West Studios, the first meeting we had with Fletch, um, who Mike Moon and Elizabeth Porter had introduced us to, was all of us in this room. And Fletch had come with this PowerPoint presentation that was less so about his own artwork and more so about individuals that he's been inspired by and different thoughts about what the city could look like and what feels reflective of this moment. I think Scott himself, he he says he sees music in color. And I think color has been so indicative of a lot of what he's done with Man on the Moon. And there's just a vivid nature to Scott. So color became a huge part of that conversation early on. Scott already knew he wanted the likenesses to, to feel tethered. And I remember one of the kind of coolest parts of it was that it ended this presentation ended with this intergalactic logo with an old painting that Fletch had done sitting behind it and Scott's like that's the logo and I, I feel like that moment was almost so indicative of the partnership and that kind of shared synergy in that meeting all of the thoughts about trying to create a look that is hand drawn or that stimulates those 2D feelings where it's perfect for its imperfections felt so in line with what the story is, which love is messy, but it can also be the most beautiful thing if you if you allow it to. And I think also another thing that came quite clear through animation is that Scott also is a pretty, pretty vivid and lives in the trippy and lives in space. He's the moon man, like he is, he's representative, representative of all of that. And allowing Fletch the freedom to enter Scott's brain, which meant entering space. And what does love look like on an intergalactic and intergalactic level was something that that came through quite early. So um, uh, you've actually uh, been working with uh, Kid Cody or Scott. Yeah, uh, you're welcome to call him Scott. You would ask you to. <laughs> um, you've, you've been working, you've, uh, have, you've had a long working relationship uh, with him. How did that come about? Honestly, so I, I used to be an agent at WME. I went to film school, started right after college in the mailroom, and I became a talent agent. And Scott was already a client of the agency and somebody that I identified that I would love, 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 love to, to work with. And I think Scott and I got very fortunate in our relationship where I started working with him uh, October 2016, which was a couple months before he went to rehab for depression. And Scott came out of that happy and creative and trusting his instincts. And I was at the point where I was looking for my work soulmate and we just found each other and were tethered. And one of the things that Scott, in addition to just being the most beautiful human being and so inspiring and constantly generating and challenging me and just all that comes with it. In addition to all of that, Scott was one of those clients who didn't want to bifurcate representation. So with Intergalactic as an example, instead of splitting it to different representative parties, it became something that he and I were really able to build together when I was in the fabric of the company. And I think so much of that, which led to the creation of Matt Solar and our company now, it's, uh, I suppose every decision I've made in, in the things that I want to be doing 
are on the heels of Scott trusting me and allowing me the opportunities to experience them. So I really do feel like work soulmate is a pretty, pretty key way to describe Scott and my relationship. And um, uh, just uh, one other thing, uh, what, did, uh, did uh, voice acting come naturally to Scott? Yeah, yeah. I mean, he's been acting for such a number of years. So I think that's always been one of his one of his specialties and something that he's known very well. But he definitely trusted his voice. And I think, too, what was really interesting was not only Scott trusting his own voice, but being so specific about others. Like, I remember when Kai was written the Ty Dolla Sign role, Scott was always thinking of Ty Dolla Sign. He called him Kai because of Ty. Like, it was it was, you know, he hadn't thought in any other directions. And of course, Ty had not done it something like this before. And I remember our conversation with Carmen Cooper, who was our casting director, where, you know, Carmen's like, let me meet him. Let me talk to him. I'll give you a sense of if I really, you know, if I know he can do this. And they had one conversation. Carmen said, you're dead right. And to me, Ty is like the, the kind of, oh, just like he's the funniest part. And he screams in that, in that project for me. So what was really cool about Scott too was just, you know, not only his own investment in himself, but being very deliberate about the participation of his peers. And I think too, to expand on that, it also ex it extended to different parties throughout the project. So he has a relationship with Cause and through conversations with Cause, he allowed us to use his artwork, which causes, you know, I think a New York artist, you know, heart and soul and, and definitive. So for that to be far, part of the fabric of New York meant a lot to Scott or he of course uh, was incredibly close with Virgil Abloh and part of his thinking about doing an animated show. I think this was one of the first things he said when we ultimately decided Intergalactic would be fully animated was, but I don't want them to wear the same thing every episode. Like if this is New York and this is a representation of that, they'll be changing their clothes. And that led very early to a conversation with Virgil about designing wardrobe. And he, I mean, he gave us access to Off-White in its totality. And I feel, you know, so much of the characters' personalities come through based on their attire. And that's, you know, just another indication of what Scott can do with his peers. Well, Karina, thank you so much for joining thank us. And we, look, and we look forward to uh, having you join our panel in just a little bit. Thank you. Thank you for taking this time. I really appreciate it. Our pleasure. I'm Charlie Bright of Gold Derby. And today I'm speaking with uh, Sung Jin An, the, uh, the art animation supervisor and supervising director of the Amazon Prime series, The Legend of Vox Machina, as part of our Meet the Experts TV animation panel. Uh, first question I wanted to ask you is, so th this whole thing was uh, based on, uh, came from uh, Dungeons and Dragons and a Dungeons and Dragons campaign. Were you a fan of Dungeons and Dragons prior to working on the series? Um, ironically, no, I, I never got a chance to play Dungeons and Dragons. And it wasn't until I got to, you know, collaborate with the people from Critical Role that they introduced me to this whole world of tabletop gaming that I was unaware of. So actually, could you uh, explain, uh, talk about this group, Critical Role, how, uh, how they came to be and how their ideas ended up becoming an animated series? Yeah, um, so getting to know them, I learned about their past and origin story. So they're they're essentially boiled down just a group of friends who decided to play Dungeons and Dragons together for decades. Then you know throughout their their journey, they've all become successful like voice actors and creators in their own right. And then um, Davis actually have a established like company and a big Twitch presence and content presence on YouTube and create. Pro through a brand for themselves tied to their Dungeons and Dragon passion. So it wasn't until that their fan base and community became so huge that um, they were driven to come to Titmouse Animation Studio where I was, was, was when I was first met them. And um, instantly, you know, like uh, I really got their true intention and, and passion. Like they made me feel like I was invited to like their circle of friends and made me feel very comfortable. And, you know, they weren't, they weren't, being a passing a judgment of like, oh, I've never uh, played Dungeons right. They're very welcoming and warming with that and, and really uh, got me invested into their in their characters as well. I've always found uh D, &D players to be very welcoming uh, in my experience as well. So mm -hmm. it's nice to know that, that that goes across uh the spectrum there. Yeah. Um 
uh, so uh, we d- uh, we had the second season of the show come out uh, earlier this year. What would you say is the biggest difference in the approach to this material in season two as opposed to what was done in the first season? Yeah, you know, I, I, I would say season two was definitely when we felt like we actually understood the show we wanted to make. Season one was about shooting for the stars and setting goals for ourselves and try to hit and reach those goals. And then by season two, even though we were met with new creative challenges like like dragons, dragons and more dragons. Um, at that point, we were well, well versed in our like creative language and our pipeline of process and how we handled each character and, and and really got to know each character's personality down to the point where we knew like the poses and gestures that they would do during certain scenarios and such. So yeah, uh, season two in a nutshell, like we was when we truly understood the show we we're making, which then gave us the bandwidth to continually push, push the vision that we wanted to go for. And uh, to uh, was there any uh, difficulty in trying uh, 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 for the for the for critical role in trying to you know come up with in trying to craft the story for season two, or did it all just sort of come naturally to them? Um, yeah, I mean, like, I think one of the unique scenarios about this show and working with Critical Role is this this entire story is based off their actual Dungeon and Dragon game that they played together, like, many years ago. And obviously, they have to take creative, like, creative decision choices to translate it into, you know, an animated series format because, like, their campaign lasted for hours and hours and hours, and we got to cut it down, right? So, uh, but that's why I really appreciate working with uh, the critical role team because um, through their they were like bring the initial like script base and initial story that they want to go for and then once we start going in and start making the episodes um, they allowed me a lot of creative freedom to pitch them ideas like oh like I understand like this has to happen which leads to this but what if like to that connective tissue like we kind of construe it in this angle and and kind of push it visually like this so they're very receptive and collaborative in that sense. I really appreciate working with uh, with them because uh, it's not always a simple translation from uh, let alone idea from your head to animation to even like a Dungeon Dragons game to animation. So it was a it was a fun process in its in its own way. So um, uh, one thing I'm always very curious about what is uh, were there any challenges you faced with uh nailing down the designs of the characters um actually luckily uh it wasn't too much of a strewn up process uh we we got a super talented well-established designer phil barasa who uh, set the look and tone of the characters and his initial pass already landed us like 80 percent in the radius and at that point like initially in his first pass, the critical role team was super ecstatic just to see their characters come to life from such a well-seasoned veteran hand. And after that, it was just kind of like, oh, like let's play with the option for Vex's like feather pauldron. Like how long should Vex's cape be? So it was like it was like tweaks after that. So the process itself was actually pretty smooth in that sense. Was it the same with the with the settings? Because the 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 settings for it. Are are so incredibly designed and meticulous. Uh, did you have? Was it a cert? Was it a similar setup with that? Yeah, yeah ironically, we we're so fortunate too because um, that would be our art director Arthur Loftus, who was already a huge fan of Critical Role even before jumping onto the project. So he, we had the advantage of our art director knew this campaign, these characters, this world's inside and out. So he probably already uh, had something in his head uh, as to what that probably looked like. Exactly. So when it came time to actually conceptualizing, designing, designing these locations, he would pitch his ideas, show his concepts. And, you know, myself included in the critical role team, we were just blown away. We're like, like, just, yeah, this is, yeah, keep doing it, man. <laughs> like, so yeah, Arthur really, really nailed. And I think he really fulfilled his vision from being such a, a huge fan of this campaign. And um, with, with regard to uh, uh, the the people from Critical Role that are actually, you know, the writers and the, the voice actors for these role, for these uh, characters, uh, do they record all in the, all together or are they individual? Um, you know, we actually started the show pre-pandemic. So in the beginning they do, we're doing ensemble records, we're all together and 
and I got to be in the room with them. And that was a, a huge, you know, wonderful experience itself. And then of course the pandemic hit. And ever since then, uh, they have been recording separately, but you know, they have such a strong and long relationship with each other. Like they're practically friends and family. Like uh, if we need something on the fly or have last second line changes, they just hit each other up and within hours or less we will get new pickups and records instantaneously so it's really it's a really huge advantage that they're so talented but they also are such a tight-knit family and uh has there been uh any aspect of how audiences have responded to this show that has caught you off guard in any way and you know i would say what caught me off guard is like we we knew like generally this would resonate well with the fans and we're always curious about how it will do to like new people um so the comments that I read through or the feedback I get is like always from like the people who are like oh wow I, I didn't know anything about the show I jumped right in and instantly just fell into the world hooked on the characters in the world and and you know we're always trying to that was one of the big things we're trying to like balance well when we're making the show is we want to be faithful to the fans but also make something that's like um you know something that could be an easier barrier to entry or more alluring for general audience who aren't aware of the characters. Kind of like myself, like I learned this character thing so while I was kind of working on it and truly fell in love with them. And I wanted to kind of pass on that experience to like the general, the general audience. Well, uh, Sung, thank you so much for joining us and we look forward to having you joining our panel in just a little bit. Thank you. I'm Charlie Bright of Gold Derby, and today I'm speaking with Colin Heck, the supervising director of the Netflix animated series Mulligan, uh, as part of our Meet the Experts uh, TV animation panel. Uh, first question I wanted to ask you is: uh, so this is a show that comes from Robert Carlock and Sam Means, who have done a lot of who've done a lot of comedy television, especially with Tina Fey, Thirty Rock, Unbreakable Kimmy Schmidt, uh, all sorts of things like that. Um, but this is their first foray into animation. Do you, it was this was doing an animated series something that they had all is something that they had been eyeing for a while. They, when I've asked them this question before, they they've said that they. Uh, I don't think I'm telling tales out of school, but they've they've said that they were already kind of writing animation in their live action stuff. That their um, their stuff was was is very uh, will get zany <laughs> at times, and the pacing is very fast. And they like that um, they like the rhythms that you can uh, achieve in animation if if you go fast enough. And so I think they. Um, they were always looking at it and they always liked animation that they, they've talked a lot about shows that they used to watch in the 30 rock writers room. I, I remember Robert was saying that they used to watch Clarence in, in there, which was a surprise to me uh, uh, and a delight. Um, Cause I have a lot of friends that work on that show. Um, but uh, this was their first experience doing it. And, and I had to uh, do a lot of like this, this seems really fun. I think this is going to be difficult. Because, uh, uh, you know, when live action writers come into to animation for the first, first time, the, the possibilities are endless. You know, you can, the, the idea is you can do whatever you want. And the, that's true to an extent, uh, but there's a lot of stuff you still can't do. It's still, it's still very difficult to have um, a lot of crowds uh, or things like that. And so there was definitely an education process, but they picked it up really quickly. And um, the the first time, uh, they were really they really enjoyed the level of control that they got on this, as opposed to live action. Uh, and you know, in on a live action set, you're you get what you get on that day, and you're dealing with a lot of personalities, and you point the camera, and you hope that you get it, and you have a certain amount of time to get it. In animation, you have more time to mess with that stuff and to dial in the details that you want including sound including whatever so like when i the first time we went into like a dialogue editing session i was like okay i like the first half of take one and the second half of take three let's combine those and make one take that we like they were like looked at me like i was a wizard and i was like like oh you guys don't do that in, in live action that's right that it's a lot harder there um but they're like their concept of pace and the concept of the show that they kind of they wanted to make was pretty fully formed. Like they knew what they wanted to do, wanted to do, and my job was largely carrying out that vision. 
it's interesting that you bring that up about the pacing of how they've always felt like they're writing for animation because now that I think about it, shows like 30 Rock and Unbreakable Kimmy Schmidt do have that rhythm that like classic Simpsons episodes had. And and with the cutaways also, it, it really feels like that's like coming full circle, especially for you because you actually worked on The Simpsons. It, it's true. Uh, and the, I mean, I didn't supervise The Simpsons. So it was, it was a lot of like, like when I was working on The Simpsons, like watching the supervisors and you're like, oh, that, and being on this show, remembering like, oh, my supervisors on The Simpsons conducted themselves this way. But on this show, like The Simpsons is a much larger operation than this. So I had, as the supervising director, I had to do a lot like sitting in the dialogue edits or being in the records and helping direct. Um, I have said that one of the, the things that I loved the most was like, was helping direct the giant uh, stars that were on this show, like, you know, pitching lines to Tina and having her, you know, give me a courtesy laugh was a huge, like, you don't normally get to do that. Um, but pace was a very important, a very, like, the priority, I think. Um, the, when we first sat down to do the show, to, to think about how the show would look, they're, they're like, well, we want it to feel like our other shows. I was like, well, your other shows cut a lot. So I think we have to cut a lot here. Um, I mean, like, you know, cut with a lot of, uh, cut very rapidly rather. Um, and you, the, you mentioned the cutaways. There's a lot of cutaways in here. Uh, and those can be tricky sometimes. Um, but the, the intention was to make this, shoot this show like a single cam show that feels like there are other comedies. And when you combine the, cutting style and the shooting style with Jeff Ritzman's music uh, and their jokes, then I think that helps tie it together and feel like there are other shows. Um, you know, you were talking about the cast of the show. And when I was looking and when you look down the cast of the show, I think the name that stuck out the most for me because it was such a pleasant surprise to see him uh, 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 doing something prominent again was Dana Carvey. Oh, uh, yeah. As the senator. Uh, how did he come to be a part of the main cast? Ooh, I'm going to guess because uh, I don't know. I, I don't know the actual details, but Robert Carlock worked on the Dana Carvey show. Um, the, the show that had the alternating title every week of yes. the sponsor that was, that was yes. sponsoring it. Correct. Uh, and if you, there's the documentary about, I think it's called Too Funny to Fail and Robert's on that a fair amount. Um, and so they, I think they just knew each other from that. And I can't remember, I don't think they overlapped at SNL, but um, I believe that Robert and Dana had a relationship from that. And I, I don't know how exactly he, he roped him into this, but Dana committed and um, he was, he was very game to do basically anything that we asked of him. In addition to doing Lamar, like the, the main character that he does, he does a lot of other like incidental voices or just like a guy that got his butt shot off in one scene or whatever. Like he's, he was a pretty willing utility player through all this stuff. You really can't ask for a better one, honestly. <laughs> it, it was really great. And I mean, my favorite thing, which was, wasn't beneficial to the show, but like in the records, at a certain point, you know, you like you do a lot, and then you kind of get tired, and then and then he just w would tell stories about, you know, when he was a waiter in a hotel serving rich little stuff, or or like Dana's stories about being in in entertainment were great and my favorite thing, and I kept getting yelled at like, hey, we like stop stop him from telling all these stories. We have to finish the records, please. <laughs> <laughs> Got to wrap by five. Uh, exactly. <laughs> uh, um, you know, you and you mentioned, uh, you know, the experience of getting to uh, record some of the of, of getting to direct some of these people in the record. You mentioned Tina Fey. Um, uh, who were some of the other ones that you really enjoyed uh, their sessions with oh, directing? Man. Everybody. Everybody was great. I. It's hard to. It's hard to think of anybody that I didn't enjoy. Um, one of the the cool things that I got to do for the first time on this show was read against like. This was all pandemic lockdown production. I never met most of the people that worked on the show in person. Uh, some of them were in New York, some of them were here, some of them were in various places. So anytime we recorded, I was the one reading against them. And that was really fun, except when I had to like 
read against Holly Hunter because <laughs> she was great, but it's intimidating reading against an Oscar winner. And I was like having to do a Southern accent in front of Holly Hunter. And it was like, you know, I was giving it my all, but. Who has a perpetual Southern accent. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Daniel Radcliffe was great and and such a sweet guy and such a hard worker. Like he, his his stuff, the stuff that he gave us was fantastic and he was super friendly the entire time uh ted danson was great um andy samberg was great uh weird owl was great i got to see the inside of his closet it was really nice um <laughs> uh I, yeah i mean the main cat like all of the main cast was fantastic uh chrissy Teigen, this is her first like largest role like i think she had done a little bit of voice acting in missions versus the machines and this was a a an order of magnitude harder than that because she was in every episode as one of the main characters and she came to play um she was willing to do whatever we wanted and worked really hard on it and i think she gave us some really good stuff um uh nat faxon is maddie he, he was also fantastic i mean that is great in everything i think uh Sam Richardson is so funny. Uh, I loved him in the in the Detroit in Detroiters and Detroiters, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I had seen him in the, the few I think you should leave sketches that he was in, and and I I loved having him there. He was like he's kind of like the heart of the show in a lot of ways. He's he's one of the only like thinking characters, <laughs> um, and he brought some genuine emotion to places. Uh, and he was really good at selling the jokes. Um, I mean, I could do this for the rest of our time. But like... <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I, I, one other thing I'm very clear, well, really curious about is uh, how did the look for the show come about? The look for the show was set before I got on. And so they, Robert and Sam had been working with an art director named Jonathan Finn Gamino. Uh, and they, like when I got, brought on to the show they had a look that they were going for which is largely the look that is on the screen uh i had to my priority like they liked it netflix liked it everybody was like this is the, the look we're going for and at that point my responsibility was simplifying it and streamlining it so it was easier to animate because the original versions of these characters had a lot of lines on their faces and a lot of buttons and things and I was like, guys, this is going to be hard to turn. Um, and so like removing a lot of the lines on Lamar's face, for example, he was very wrinkly in, in the first iterations that I saw. But um, they like a lot of, to be honest, a lot of that stuff got done before I got involved. Um, so I was largely working with the style that they had set. Well, uh, Colin, thank you so much for joining us. And we look forward to having you join our panel in just a little bit. Thanks, Charles. It's good to be here. I'm Charlie Bright of Gold Derby, and I am uh, thrilled to be hosting this Meet the Experts TV animation panel featuring Karina Manishil, the executive producer of Enter Galactic on Netflix, Sung Jin An, the uh, animation supervisor and supervising director on Amazon Prime's The Legend of Vox Machina, and Colin Heck, the supervising director on Netflix's Mulligan. Um, first question I want to ask is, um, uh, is uh, to you, Colin, and I'm uh, and the question I have, the first question I have is, uh, what is the piece of animation that you saw and that made you say, I want to work in that, or that's what I want to do? Jeez, okay. The be the first thing I can remember is in grade school. I can't remember why, but my math teacher brought in some pencil tests from Beauty and the Beast. Why my math teacher had pencil tests from Beauty and the Beast, I have no idea why we were watching that <laughs> instead of doing math. I don't know. Uh, but it it was the first time I sort of put it together like, oh, these beautiful images on the screen are dr hand drawn that somebody does. And I like to draw. Oh, maybe I could do that someday. Um, so uh, I turned out to be very bad at math and a lot better at drawing. So <laughs> it worked out. <laughs> what about you, son? Oh, I had like a kind of a combination. Like, of course, I was first exposed to like the original 80s Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle series. 
And then uh, on the other hand, my cousin would also showed me this other um, anime series from Japan called Dragon Ball. And so I had, I was juggling both, but like, it's not that I liked one over the other. It was more of like, it widened my eyes to see like the, the spectrum and the versatility that animation, of course, I didn't know what that meant when I was little, but I kind of, in my adult years now, realized, yeah, like what really sparked my joy was like seeing like the spectrum or the versatility of like how, like the different experience you can get from different kinds of shows, just even from how they're drawn. So, you know, ever since then, I was just drawing whenever I could. And much like Colin, I'm sorely bad at math, but really good at drawing. <laughs> um, uh, and Karina, I know you're not, uh, you don't work exclusively in animation, but is there a piece of animation that was like your first eye-opening thing to uh, the medium? Yeah, I, I have to say I'm really, I'm really inspired by what both of you guys said, because I definitely grew up on Disney films, but anime was my heart and soul. I mean, I, I can't thank Toonami enough for exposing me to more things that have identified what I really love in animation. And I was joking with these guys earlier, but I almost exclusively watch anime right now. So this, that I would suppose that would be my biggest, my biggest inspiration into the space. What are you watching? Oh, everything. I mean, we can have an offline, but to say Demon Slayer, the most beautiful animation I, I've ever seen in those fight sequences, obviously Attack on Titan is the greatest of all time. And like mm -hmm. 101 other fringy ones. So I, I don't want to take the whole room's time for this, but we can, we can definitely become friends after and talk. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, uh, just for the sake of harmony, are you also bad at math? Uh, yeah, that was not, I was definitely more the English student than the math student. <laughs> I was stellar until after Algebra 1, and then it was all downhill from there. So we all have exactly. that in common here. So exactly. we're all good. It was on point. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, so, um, you know, there's so many amazing things that you can do when you tell a story through animation. I think there's so many pluses to it. Uh, and Sung, I'll start with you on this one. In your opinion, what's the best thing about be, about telling a story through animation? Well, you know, for me, um, especially being so passionate about the process of animation, I've come to learn that animation is actually the art of limitation um, because you actually want to like specifically like bespoke plan or how you want to execute certain emotions or experiences, but also like trying to keep like the, the actual artist in mind because you know, even though artists might have the passion or soul to draw anything and everything, you know, we, we want to keep like their passion and energies, you know, within constraint of reasonability. So I actually like, it's almost like a Tetris puzzle for me. I like going in, I love telling really like surreal adult stories, like um, that really gives an artist like a visceral experience, but also try to figure out how to do it where like, it's going to be like, also a passionate and fun time for the artists to do. So I want the artists to be invested as much as I am telling the story, even if it's like down to the prop designer or the animator or even the background designer. So it's a little bit of an unrealistic goal of mine, but something that I always try to strive for. And what about you, Colin? Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give two answers, I guess. So the I've My favorite times, and I've largely worked in comedy, for the most part, like you mentioned The Simpsons earlier and, and a lot of my resume is comedy. It's not all comedy, but a lot of it is. And the magic of arranging drawings and sound in a way that makes people laugh is still a, an alchemy that, that is, amazes me every time. Like, you know, I take it for granted after 40 some years of The Simpsons, but the when you can put like draw a bunch of pictures and put them on screen and people laugh. That's amazing to me. Uh, like if you sit in a room and a lot of people are laughing at the same thing that you put together, that I, it's a pretty, a pretty heady experience. Um, separately, working on Legend of Korra allowed us to push some boundaries in terms of like stuff that I wasn't even sure that we could pull off and it got pulled off. And I'm not talking about comedy. I'm talking about like action scope, uh, in it, there's some stuff in Legend of Korra that I look back now and I'm like, how did we do that? I, I think we all went into a trance. Um, uh, and that, that like, the mix of dynamics of, of like 
intense, incredible action and basically magic and uh, and emotion is a uh, try. I, I, this is not a succinct answer in any way, but the being able to uh, create dynamics on screen that make people feel something, I guess, is the the answer to all of this stuff. Mm-hmm. Before I was talking about laughter, and now I'm talking about you know the like are they going to be okay? <laughs> like creating a feeling of danger for these drawings. That, that's amazing. It's way more interesting than math, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we can all agree. <laughs> what about you, Karina? Um, I, I would, I, I'll have a twofold answer too. I think in, in our experience, obviously the freedom of what you can show was something that really drew us to animation, being able to show halos around a girl. And that's the expression of seeing somebody that you first love or living in space or living in different color scapes. That, that freedom, I think, allowed us to take something which in its like, thesis is a very simple love story and make it feel like an expression that's very new. The other thing, and this is, I suppose, a little personal for Scott, but in his experience with music and as a recording artist, the buck always starts and stops with him. There was, you know, he has producers he works with and people who are working with him on it throughout, but he has to have the impetus for the song and the lyrics for the song and say it's done and here's where it goes on the album. And it's a bit of a personal experience, but with this process of intergalactic, he saw like having this little idea up here and it touches 350 hands all around the world over a course of three years. And somehow all of those hands are moving in tandem. And the thing that he saw at the end was even better than what he could have ever imagined. And for him, I mean, truly uh, he cried at the first screening we did at intergalactic for that reason, because it's such a profound medium to think that somehow by some synergy all of us are moving in the exact same way and i I don't know there's something special about this medium just for that and uh so something uh uh i I had someone say i can't remember if it was in a movie or a tv animation panel last year uh say to me that they were say that they were very um they they want they always want to uh uh, emphasize that animation is a medium; it is not a genre. And we heard that a lot this year, uh, whenever, uh, mainly whenever Guillermo del Toro was giving uh, a speech for uh, uh, his Pinocchio movie, uh, and he uh, and he made that a very big part. And uh, I think it's an important thing. And there are so many different kinds of stories that have been told through animation, but also have yet to be told through animation. And I was wondering uh, if there are any kinds of stories you'd like to see done through animation. And I'll start with you, Karina. Oh, that's a great question. I I feel like Guillermo is onto it because I don't think that there's any limit to the type of stories that can be told through animation. And I think even considering the moments that really move me, and we're talking about Disney and anime and all of these circumstances, these are things that we grew up with. And still you can get the chills just thinking, as an example, my son was watching Lion King the other day, the music comes on with Mufasa's death. And I I could tell you frame by frame exactly what happens in that moment. So I feel like there is a visceral quality to this medium that really tethers to our memory, our 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 senses. And if we allow more genres to be explored in it, it, it's all the merrier. I mean, the first thing that came to my head is I'd love to see like a true horror film in animation. I stole mine. Yeah. Did I steal it? Oh, we could talk about this more. I mean, as I'm talking about this, I'm thinking visceral experiences and horror is one of those yeah, I think there you go. It's I It's very difficult to answer. pull off. Yeah. It's very difficult to pull off too. I agree. But mm-hmm. that would be something I'd love to see. Yeah, and um uh, I'll go to you next, Colin. Uh, do you want do you, is there anything you wanted to add to that or any other one? Yeah, I mean I it's a question of like like this stuff is happening. Everything that we're talking about is happening. It's just is it happening in America? And I would love to see bigger uh genre explorations in animation i think i've heard some rumblings of things that are happening but like uh i would love to see a something that has the space to be creepy on an american theater screen um or or horror as horror as karina was saying um uh, i mean we just as a change like i love 
com- comedic animation. I love a lot of stuff that Disney and Pixar are doing. I love um, a lot of stuff that's coming out, but I would love to see other stuff. Uh, like Pinocchio, the, the fact that Pinocchio exists is really cool. Uh, I'd, I'd like to see us see everybody do more of that. Yeah. And I mean, like, it, 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 it whenever uh, people are asking me for a show recommendation, one of the ones I always go to is Bojack Horseman. And <laughs> the thing about that is that it, it, cause it has some of the most incredible, like, sight comedic gags, but then will hit you in uh-huh. the gut emotionally. <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> um, uh, uh, what about you, Sam? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I felt kind of fortunate in a way of like, uh, even though it was like for an episode, episode four, season one, we got to explore like a horror episode, which is a first for me. It's it's not like like Colin was saying, it's not very common in animation yet, um, and definitely because it's also challenging. So we definitely um, stepped up to the plate and tried to make it as horrific as could. Um, but personally, too, I would love to explore like um, themes or stories of like more tragedy, something that can really almost make the audience go powerless like get them invested in a, a character or story and have it so deeply like moving or seated in their experience that like as the story unfolds as it progresses i almost want to extract it and a reaction from them like, like like i don't want like they know what's about to happen they with every fiber in their body don't want to happen because of the the like the, the anticipation of the tragedy that's gonna unfold and such like so um I'm sure there there are like films or maybe even other animation pieces out there but at least um uh, in my personal career and experience I would love to explore something in that direction. Basically we want to torture people. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that's what we get to do, yeah skip math or torture people <laughs> oh man that's gotta that's gotta be a tagline for something now <laughs> 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 um and so one other thing that i just love is i one of the things i love about animation is that when you watch something and you hear a character speaking and you all and you have to have that distance where you you realize you recognize the voice but you can't put your finger out and then it hits you and then there are certain times you hear that you recognize that you recognize the voice and you just like it hits you like a freight train like oh my god i can't believe i'm hearing this person either saying these lines like i think of like susan sarandon in an episode of rick and morty just completely blew my mind um or or keith olbermann voicing a blue whale that's a news anchor on bojack horseman my first <laughs> um uh, have you ever had any of those moments watching something animated uh i'll go to you first colin i feel like it's constant i, I feel like that happens all the time i like uh i watched all of strange world and for it was just nagging me for a long time like who is the, who's the main guy and i like i figured out halfway through that it was jake gyllenhaal and I, it blew my mind um uh, yeah, you know, basically every voice in Bojack, like every <laughs> single voice in Bojack. Um, uh, Bob's Burgers has a ton of that because, like, I like a lot of, like, excuse, excuse me, apparently I have an appointment. Um, the like when Paul F. Tompkins shows up in something, it's very exciting to me. I love his comedy. It's just a joy to see him. Um, I, I, there's too many examples for me to think of, but I like. I don't know how many people have watched Mulligan, but the when we started doing the records for Mulligan, I was like, I don't think it, like, it. I forget that Lamar is Dana Carvey a lot. Uh, I don't know if that's everybody's experience, but he's doing a different enough voice that will be in edits and stuff. And I'm like, oh, right, this is Garth. Like, th- this is Dana Carvey, right. <laughs> like, I watched Wayne's World the other day and, and it was, you know, he's amazing in it. And I was like, oh, right. We, that was, that's my guy. <laughs> so it's kind of what you're talking about. Yeah. And what about you, Karina? Oh, mine, mine definitely was when I first heard John Benjamin again, H. John Benjamin, and it brought me back to home movies because that was my, one of my <laughs> favorites growing up. And I was, it was, and then of course now, he, I mean, I, he's like my heart and soul and everything I see Bob's burgers truly I can't get enough of it's Archer it's endless but but that was that was a uh, an early early moment with that I remember seeing him on Dr. Katz professional therapist on Comedy Central all those years ago yep. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what about you son uh well you know mine was mine's like it was such a small moment like but I remember distinctly in season one of Vox Machina 
we were building an animag in an edit session and this one incident was one incidental guard on the side of the shot had one sent one line and it like you said like it clinged on to me and I couldn't like, I was like oh my god that sounds so familiar and it wasn't until I realized later uh, when I was talking with the critical role folks they're like oh yeah we got logic the rapper just come in and just do one line I'm like <laughs> I was like, what? <laughs> I was, this is like, obviously, years ago, pre-pandemic, but I'm like, oh, yeah, you know, we're fun. So we're just like, hey, do you want to do an animated boy? And like, yeah, yeah, sure. And they just invited him over. He just read one line, made it to the final cut episode, and they told nobody. And it was just like, yeah. So it just that was just like a pretty um, memorable and funny uh, memory I have from season one. Well, uh, uh, Karina, Sung, and Colin, uh, thank you so much for joining us. We wish you all the best. And uh, thanks for joining us for our uh, Meet the Experts panel on TV animation. Yes, it was a pleasure. Thank thanks for having me. Thank you for yeah. having us. Really enjoyed it.